Buonasera a tutti. Welcome everyone. Good evening. My name is Gabriella Maletti and I'm the Director of Special Programs at the National Italian American Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please note that all attendees are muted and have their videos and chats turned off. During this webinar, only the panelists will be visible. At the end of our conversation, we will be taking some questions, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask a question. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. And now I'd like to welcome the NIAF Vice Chair of Cultural Affairs, the Honorable Anita Bivakwa McBride. Anita? Yeah, great. Thank you, Gabriella. And good evening, everyone. Buonasera and welcome uh, to the National Italian American Foundation's virtual program. Uh, tonight, we're very excited about the topic that we are bringing to you, examining Christopher Columbus, the truths and myths with Stanford uh, professor, now emerita, Carol Delaney. NIAF, as you know, for many of you who are on this uh, broadcast tonight, many of you are members, uh, and some, are you, some of you are new to us. But we are a membership-based, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1975. Our mission is to preserve Italian American heritage and culture and to promote and inspire a positive image and a legacy of Italian Americans in the United States and to strengthen and empower the ties between the United States and Italy. We're based in Washington, DC, but we reach everywhere, particularly now during this period through our virtual programs that we are able to touch so many audiences around the country and also in Italy, but also audiences that are not all Italian American. And we, we welcome um, everyone to join us and to support our mission, our mission of education, our mission of scholarship, our mission to help encourage a next generation of Italian Americans and their contributions um, to um, uh, society and to our country. But all of our, so we have been engaging like everyone else in a very robust virtual program offering. And we love to invite you to join us and support our mission, support what NIAF does, mm -hmm. and including programs like this tonight, a very timely topic, one that has certainly elicited very strong opinions on all sides. Part of our mission is education, as I mentioned. So we see this as an, as an education opportunity to really look at the truth and look also at the myths and have a, a thoughtful conversation and discussion. We hope to have more uh, conversations on this topic of Christopher Columbus. But with that, I wanted to welcome uh, my, uh, my uh, Government Affairs Committee uh, co-chair and also our vice chair for international at NIAF, John Cavelli. He will be leading this conversation tonight, introducing our guest speaker, Professor uh, Delaney, and then also moderating the conversation and the question and answer. So again, thank you for supporting us. Thank you for joining us tonight. Grazie, John. Anita. Grazie. Thank you, Anita. Um, Christopher Columbus statues around the country have been destroyed or removed, and many American cities have started to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. Tonight, we will examine why, from the late 20th century to today, Columbus has become a figure of intense controversy. We are left with deep, conflicting opinions about this Italian explorer who went across the ocean four times uh, in, in about 500 years ago in small wooden boats, a feat that all agree changed the course of human history. I think that's probably the only thing that everybody agrees on. <laughs> this evening, to debunk the myths and lay out the truths is Stanford Professor Emerita, author and anthropologist Carol Delaney. She received a Master of Theological Studies from Harvard, University, Harvard Divinity School, and a PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of Chicago and is a graduate of Boston University. Delaney was the assistant director of the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard and a visiting professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Brown University. She is now an emerita professor at Stanford University and a research scholar at Brown University. Professor Delaney is the author of several books, including Columbus and the Quest for Jerusalem. 
In addition to numerous articles and invited lectures, she has also had, as of this date, 48 letters published in varied publications, <laughs> New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And this is my favorite fun fact about Carol. In the spring of 2014, she walked more than 500 miles on the Camino de Santiago in <laughs> North Spain and walked 280 miles in the spring of 2015. She walked the coast to coast path across England with her brother in May of 2016. Um, Carol, I kind of say all that because I'm fascinated by this idea that maybe you were walking across um, England and you thought about Columbus, but what was what got you excited and interested in Christopher Columbus? Uh, I'm trying to remember what happened. I must have been at Stanford at that time. Um, and I'm trying, I, I really can't remember what happened, but yeah. You were doing the millennial, if I'm not mistaken, was the millennial fever. Oh, it, thank you. Yeah, I was teaching um, in the class in 99, 1999 at Stanford. I was teaching a class called Millennial Fever, you know, to look at the frenzy that Americans were having about what's going to happen with the turn of the millennium. Planes are going to crash, computers are going to crash, etc. And I came across one little footnote about Columbus's millennial beliefs. I'd never heard of them. And I asked some people in the history department at Stanford, had they ever heard of them? I mean, I knew nothing about Columbus at that time. And um, they said, no, they'd never heard of them. So I thought this was really interesting since a lot of my work has been about religion, although I'm a critic. And so the more I looked at it, the more I found out how much this was involved in his whole project to go across um, the Atlantic uh, to, you know, save. Uh, I mean, his whole quest to, to get funds to set up a trading post with the Grand Khan of China. Mm -hmm. And the funds were to be used to finance a crusade to take Jerusalem back from the Muslims for the, before the end of the world. And he had already figured out how many times, how many years were left. And so it was a big mission for him. And nobody knows about this, that this was behind all of his voyages. He would never have done those voyages without this mission. Never. You know, the, you know and, and Carol, the, you know, it's an interesting moment in history, right? So Spain had just recently been uh, brought together um, and the and the Muslims had been had been taken out of Spain uh, after hundreds of years of war. Um, Constantinople had fallen. Um, right. There was this moment of fervor, and that things were going to be changing, and that there there had to be some change. And I'm just curious. And Columbus, you know, you drop Columbus into this narrative, and I'm fascinated because you're an anthropologist. You know, you're a cultural anthropologist. Can you help explain what that is, and how do you use that? You know, how do you use that, uh, the research there and that study for this historical figure? Well, anthropologists are supposed to get into the culture that they are studying. And so my earlier uh, fieldwork was in a little village in Turkey, trying to understand all kinds of ideas about Turkish stuff, about religion and so forth. I won't go into that. And so when I approached this, uh, the thing about Columbus, I realized I had to get into 15th century Italy and Europe. And, you know, I realized that that was the time when, you know, the Ottomans had taken over Constantinople and there were lots of Genoese living there. And so that barred them from going the overland route to take uh, the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but also to go across Asia like Marco Polo had done. And so they were really sort of trapped. And a lot of then my, you know, some of my research was in Turkey and in Constantinople. But um, so you have to find out what people were thinking in the 15th century. And that was his world. I mean, he lived in Genoa. And at that time, that's when Constantinople had been taken. There was no route to go uh, east. And so that's when he, you know, moved, uh, did all the sailing stuff and went with the Portuguese at first and then went to the Spain, to Spain. 
So you, you use this title, Columbus and the Quest for Jerusalem. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of the research that got you to this point where, you know, you had this moment, millennial fervor, interested in the moment, um, the history, um, you know, what then brought you to write a book about it? I mean, not everybody says, oh, I'm really excited about Columbus. <laughs> I know, I, I, I could never have imagined myself. I mean, so I, in one of the readings for my class on millennial fever, I came across one tiny footnote about Columbus's millennial apocalyptic beliefs. And I thought, what? I'd never heard of anything like this. And so I went to ask the historians at Stanford, had they ever heard about this? No, nobody had ever heard about this. So I thought, this demands some investigation. And so the more I looked into it, the more I found out that it was absolutely behind his desire to do this, uh, his research and sailing. Are we back? I think, well, I know John was having um, some difficulty with his, with his internet. So I think I'll pick up from there until he can. Did you hear what I said though? Yes. Oh, good, okay. Yes, yes, I ab absolutely did hear what you said. And I think John was asking too um, about the, um, the title of your book and why you chose the title of your book of Columbus and the Quest for Jerusalem. Yes, nobody knows that that was behind his whole project. It's in his writings, which I never, you know, I never even knew anything about Columbus really. Right. Except in 1492, he sailed the ocean blue. Like every, that's what everybody else knows. And the more I s got interested in this, the more I found out. And the whole thing was to go um, to Jerusalem to take it back from the Muslims before the end of the world. He figured out how many years were left and it had to be in Christian hands so the sepulcher could be rebuilt so Christ could come again and save all the believers. Mm. And, his, and even when he was you know, sailing across to the new world, he kept requesting priests to be sent to baptize the people because baptized, first of all, baptized people could not be enslaved. Mm. But also then they would be saved you know, at the end of the world. And Columbus figured out how many years were left. And there were not that many years according to him mm. and so he figured out that his voyage was really very important to try and um convert all the people to christianity so that they would be saved he asked oh it's in all his writings he kept asking isabella please send more priests please please send them they only sent one and he was horrible he did nothing and so you know all of the things he wanted to have done we're not done so apologies God, I'll give it back to you no, no, that, no. that's yeah, okay. okay please stay please stay because <laughs> i'm having some you know the problems of the storm are still being felt up here in new york yeah. so okay. for, for uh, losing but i wanted to kind of change the conversation just a little bit and i okay. want people have questions please send those questions in um but let me start with why should we celebrate columbus from your perspective you, you've read all this information oh. Why do you think Columbus is an important person for the United States and for the world to recognize? I, the more I've done this research and written this book, I think he's an amazing person that he actually wanted to go across the ocean, which no, nobody had ever done before. I mean, he was blocked from going the other way because the Pope had given that to the Portuguese. So the only way he could go was west. He had no idea where he was going. He thought he was going to meet the Grand Khan, set up the trading post to get the money, you know, to finance this crusade. So the more I read about his writings, and I've read a lot of his writings, and I've seen some of his original letters, I've held them in my hands um, in Genoa, I came to respect him. I really liked him, actually. I would have liked to have met him. <laughs> Mm. Um, and maybe one day I will, as somebody suggested. Um, but I think he was a good person, and I think his motives were, were very good. So, so, you know, you, there are so many criticisms, though, uh, Carol, of him. And, and 
Can you walk us through some of the criticisms that, that you've heard about? And you know, how do you respond to those things? The Las Casas writings, there's so many places writings about him. You know, help us understand a little bit about what those, you know, what they're saying and, and, and help. I, I thought Las Casas was on his side for a long time. I, I, I'm not quite sure. I, it's been a long time since I did this research, so I can't really recall that. But his motives, it's in his writings. Um, they were all very good about trying to, I mean, maybe you don't think it's so, so good to try and, you know, save these people and Christianize them and baptize them and send priests and so forth. But that was his motive. And to try and go to the, uh, to the Grand Khan and set up the training post the, muff the profits of which were to be used to finance the crusade to take Jerusalem back from the Muslims. It's in all of his writings. Mm. That was the whole motive, was to go hopefully meet the Grand Khan where, you know, Marco Polo had gone, but he couldn't go the other way. Um, so he was hoping to set up the trading post mm. to make the money to finance these mm -hmm. projects. Well, one of the one of the things to, um, to uh, uh, Carol uh, that we have as an organization just you know tried to educate ourselves and of course uh, others too about the criticisms of when he did ar ar arrive in this hemisphere, what he in what he encountered on. Um, uh, here, but also his own people, the people that he led to uh, make these very dangerous voyages and what his relationship was like with his own men. Um, whether they had the same uh, interest in what he did or what was their interest because- oh, I they, think he, his, his yeah. whole interest, it's so clear in his writings. Uh, he really liked the native people he made very good friends with Guacanagari, the chief mm -hmm. that he first met. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the people don't realize the Santa Maria went aground on the first voyage. Mm -hmm. And so he had to leave 39 men there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, while they were still there, you know, they were exploring, they made friends with Guacanagari and so forth. But then he had to go back, you know, to get some ships to rescue the people that had gone aground. So when he came back, all of the men were dead. They mm. were left on the beach. And the people, Isabella sent 17 ships. Can you imagine? Mm. Hundreds of people, hundreds mm. of men, hundreds of people. And they all wanted to you know, take revenge on Guacanagari. Columbus said, absolutely not. He's my friend. He went and talked to Guacanagari and he learned that the men had gone marauding and raping against his orders. I've seen his orders. They mm -hmm. are published. I've held them in my hand. Um, do not do this. Do not do that. That's what they did. And so those people from this other group came and killed them all. Mm. It was, had nothing to do with Guacanagari. He remained friends with Guacanagari. And in fact, one, a, a son of one of the chiefs became his godson. Mm. On the, on the, um, when he went back to um, Spain to get some rescue ships, um, he took six natives. He said more wanted to go. They were not enslaved by any means. He said more wanted to go. One of them became his godson and remained his godson, traveled with him and was an interpreter for his other voyages. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, you know, it was these horrible men who went marauding and raping and doing things against his order, orders. And it was a very difficult time. Is there a, um, was there a period where his men turned on, turned on him? Did I read that correctly in history or is that a myth as well? I, th I think that's right. You know, I can't remember my book. It's been a while right now, mm -hmm. but I think you're absolutely right about that. Mm -hmm. And I think they wanted to get rid of him mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of them tried to get him, but somehow he, he escaped and went back. Um, and at some point, he even hung two of his own men mm. because of the horrible deeds that they had done against the native people. 
I mean, he was friendly with them. Mm. He remains friends with them the whole time. Well, what is it that we are not um, just as a community or you're an educator um, in higher education, but what are we not doing that we're not, this information is not more uh, widely seen or recognized? Is it? I think that's a very good point because I think a lot of places seem to want to get rid of Columbus Day. They're desecrating the statues. They think that he did all these horrible things. They know nothing about him. Mm. And I think what needs to be done is if they're going to remove the statues, they should put up a plaque and mm. talk about who he was. He mm. is not the person that people are accusing him of being. Not at all. Well, not at all. In, in I came to like him very much and respect him. I think he was absolutely right on. Well, I find that very interesting that you said that. And I think that's actually very inspiring. So you really took the time to read in his words and, and touch things that had touched him. And of course, that changes yeah, perspective yeah, yeah. For, for anyone. I wondered if um, you could maybe talk about. So in 1986, the Congress... Um, established or passed legislation to establish a commission honoring the quincentenary of Christopher Columbus, which was in 1992. So the, the legislation was passed in 86 or 87, signed by the President of the United States at the time, and a commission was established. Whereas that commission took five years to plan nationwide celebrations um, honoring Columbus and his a voyage to the discovery of the new world. Um, and with that, a number of, of uh, Italian American uh, organizations and groups um, you know, had raised money to put some of these statues up around the country. Many had been here long before that, of course, by Italian immigrants um, of the first and second wave of immigrants. But what that to me just it shows what have what have we lost in this period of time from 1992 till now? Um, are we not giving it a fair a balanced discussion of who Columbus was, the good and the bad? Did we try and make it too good that um, we've overlooked you know what the the negative and because by I think today's people standard, know nothing, I think no people know nothing about him. Mm. And they're blaming him for things he did not do and destroying these statues because they think he, you know, was destroying all the Native Americans. That mm. is not true. He mm. was friends with them. They've got to read his book. They've got to read my book, but mm. they have to read his diary and the way he was friendly with them. And that remained, yeah. that remained throughout the voyages. Um, you know, some of his men did horrible things and he, as I told you, I, um, he was very uh, against them. He hung two of them mm -hmm. as an example, said this will not be tolerated. Um, mm -hmm. People know nothing about him. I think that's the problem. They know nothing about the man. Okay. And that's what well, I was hoping to do with my book. Well, and, and uh, again, I am going to get your book, Carol. I should have read it before tonight, but I'm, I'm fascinated because I like what you have done was actually read his words. And so you have a different connection to who he is and not this figure that seems so far um, from, you know, people's Absolutely. reality right now. And I think before we go to questions I, um, from the audience, which we have a number that are coming in, okay. but one last thing that I wanted to uh, ask you about in his um, uh, financer's mind, Queen Isabella, was he successful? Did he, did he accomplish what they wanted accomplished on this voyage? Probably not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was supposed to be setting up a trading post mm -hmm. um, with the Grand Con. You're right. And I must say, um, people don't realize this, there were lots of times when, you know, they're on the island of Hispaniola. Mm -hmm. So he leaves the men there while he goes off sailing, trying to find the Grand Con. He still thinks he's in the periphery of the Grand Con. So he goes off sailing, trying to find the Grand Con so he can set up this trailing, 
trading post like Marco Polo had done. Mm -hmm. That never happened, obviously. Okay. But he, you know, he was off sailing a lot and he left all these, you know, instructions, do not do this, do not do that. And of course, that's what they did. Well, I think and for people to remember too, and then John is back so he can start the q and A. I mean, the navigation that he had was, of course, incredibly rudimentary. I mean, you just can't really um, I bet you he had better amazing. I, I'm going to yes. disagree in that he probably had better internet service than I <laughs> Than you certainly <laughs> do. Yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that. I think that's one thing. But um, Ted Valenti, we've got, we started getting some questions, Professor. Yes. Um, okay. One which I think was, is really interesting. Uh, one criticism was his use of slaves. How would you frame that conversation? Mm. What are you talking about use of slaves? Yeah. I, it was I don't know, I don't know what you're talking for you about. to say that. He, <laughs> so. he was not, he did not want to have slaves. It was the men who, you know, Isabel had sent over and went marauding around and, and picked up all these slaves. Columbus was very against that. Mm. Mm -hmm. so Sorry he to disappoint people, but he was really well, against that. Very so that. Maybe I missed, but was it at one point, didn't he come back with, weren't certain people brought back though? I believe it was yes. on the second voyage. So if you could just yeah. explain a little bit uh, about- well, a lot of the men that, he, that were there, you know, these horrible men had collected all these people as slaves. And so they brought them to where Columbus was. And yes, he could either have released them, which would have been very, very difficult, and he did send them back. But that was not his plan, and it was not his idea, and he was very much against it. Got it, got it. And um, you know, in terms of, again, just staying on that for a second, what, you know, what was his feelings about the local, the local communities? I mean, how did he feel about the local Taino people and the Caribs, et cetera? He liked them. He liked them. He, he remained friends with Guacanagari, the chief, throughout. And he liked the people. He thought, well, at, at one point in his diary, he said, these are the best people in the whole world. They're natural Christians. They love their neighbors as themselves. I mean, he wrote glowing reports about the native people. It's in his mm -hmm. diary. People need to read his diary. Nobody knows he has this whole diary. It's been published in English. Mm -hmm. Plus, and, uh, lots and uh, lots of other uh, material that still exists. But the diary, everybody should read the diary. Got it. It would so, change their opinion right away. So Michael Petz writes, I'm curious if Professor Delaney ever came across any writings of the crew who were on his voyages, or were they mostly illiterate? It would be interesting to see a primary source other than Columbus on the ships. I have no idea whether there are any other people, and I have no uh, information about that. Got it. He was literate, he wrote, and we have his writings, and I've seen them. So Roger Co uh, Cocchetti writes, w did Columbus realize that he was not in Asia? I mean, you know, it's one of those things where Vespucci... <laughs> It's hard to the, know. Like, it's hard to know. And, you know, and, and I think maybe it was the fourth voyage, you know, he kept going toward the Panama Canal and he reached the north coast of South America. But I don't think he, and they told him that there was a big ocean on the other side of the Panama Canal, but I don't think he ever realized that that was a big continent. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think he knew where he was. Got it, interesting. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, Donald Masada writes, "Why? W what was the reason Queen Isabella wanted to come to America? Was she? Did she buy into the idea of the um, raising of the funds? I mean, was it really about the money? What, what were some of her reasons for being so supportive of Columbus?" I don't think she ever thought about America. Nobody thought about America. She thought he was going to China to set up a trading post with the Grand Khan, mm -hmm. like Marco Polo the profits of which, as I've said, were to be used to fund a crusade to take Jerusalem back from the Muslims yep. before the end of the world. That was in all the writings. Nobody knew anything about America. No. It was and he had to go west because the Pope had given the other route to the Portuguese. Yep. So there was no way that he could have gone the other way. And people don't seem to realize that. He had to go west. So Sabrina Munau writes, Columbus was put in jail for the horrible things that he did. 
What was that was so horrible? He did not do those and he was not put in jail. What happened was these horrible people that had been sent over captured him. Bobadilla is the name of the guy may, mainly. Bobadilla captured him while Columbus was out sailing and then he came back and Bobadilla cap uh, captured him, put him in chains and sent him back on the boat back to Spain. Isabella immediately released him. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately released him. It was Bobadilla who did these horrible, horrible things uh, in the New World and didn't want Columbus around so that he captured him and put him in chains when he got back to wherever he was. Mm -hmm. um, it's in my book. So people have got to read the book. It's all in there. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, was at the end, you know, I think, um, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier, but Columbus did become a Franciscan monk. Yes. I'm saying. Like he had this kind of religious, he was oh, not absolutely. Religious, but he had this religious moment. How did he, you know, uh, James Cohen asked the question, you know, how did he feel coming out of that? Was he, was he proud of the work that he had done? And how was he received in Europe when he, when he returned? He was always very religious. He was always very uh, related to the Franciscans. He always stayed with them wherever he traveled. I've been to the monastery of La Rabida before the voyages, which is where he stayed. They keep his room and his utensils and everything. I've been there. And I walked down the seven miles to Palos where, where the bo boats took off. They have replicas of the boats now down there. I've drunk water from the fountains where they took their water before they got on. I mean, he, tell me back at the question. I can't, I've gotten off the track somehow. In, in terms of like, what, how did, well, it's actually kind of two questions. So one question is really, you know, how did he see his life work? right, as he kind of came to the end of his life, um, how did he see the work that he had accomplished? By that point, there was a lot of people saying it was the new world, it was a new world, or it was, it was not your... That's, it was hard, that's hard to tell. I mean, I think he always thought that he was on the um, periphery of the Grand Khan. Mm -hmm. And he was just hoping, you know, to meet up with the Grand Khan and set up the trading post. Um, the money was to be used to take Jerusalem back from the Muslims. That was his mm -hmm. whole purpose. Mm -hmm. Because Jerusalem had to be in Christian hands so the sepulcher could be rebuilt. It's in his writings. Mm -hmm. So that Christ could come again and save all the believers. Which is why he kept asking Isabella to send priests to Christianize and baptize the natives. Because mm -hmm. once they're baptized, they cannot be enslaved, first of all. But second of all, they would be saved. Mm -hmm. Why was end. the priest bad? The first, you said the one priest she sent was bad. Oh. Why? Boba, no, was it Bobadilla? I can't remember. Okay. Well, he was part of the problem of, you know, it's capturing the natives and not, and not doing anything about baptizing them and, and teaching mm -hmm. them. Columbus mm -hmm. wanted them to be taught about Christianity so, and so, to be baptized. So Grace Grace Sardina uh, asked the question. Uh, you you spoke a little bit about how Columbus felt about the natives. How did the natives feel about Columbus? Well, that's really hard to tell because there aren't really any writings left from those people at that time. They they were not literate. Mm -hmm. But I also want to just go back to the one, the yep. natives that that he took back were all baptized. None of them were enslaved. Mm -hmm. Two of them remained at court. One became Columbus's godson. I think I mentioned that and traveled with him for some other voyages, but none of them were enslaved. They were all baptized. And so that's what he wanted. And he kept asking for priests to come and you know, teach the people and baptize them so they would not be enslaved. Because he said they are the most wonderful people and on and on and on. And I, I get, I, of course, we don't have writings from the from the uh, native communities that were living right. at the time. Right. But if right. you could talk a little bit as an anthropologist, right? What was the dynamics of these Native American groups? We have this kind of perception that um, America was this kind of idyllic world that, Col and the, the narrative now is around Columbus having come there, <laughs> and destroyed no. this Garden of Eden. And I'm just curious, you know, what what in your readings and your writings, what did you come across? Well, first of all, the people that Columbus came in contact with were a group 
that we now call the Arawak, but that was not the name. Somebody asked me why didn't I talk, you know, put that name in my book. They, that was not the name that they associated with themselves. But they did talk about the Caribs, who had were a, a, a warmongering group nearby. And the Caribs apparently had come and attacked the people that Columbus knew, had taken children away, and had uh, done horrible things to the people that Columbus knew. And so there were these two groups in the Caribbean that he already came in contact with. The ones that he, were, he was friendly with were the, what we now know as the Arawak. And they were very much um, in contact, contacts with and against the Caribs. The Caribs, and it's in his writings, the Caribs had, you know, ado uh, not adopted, taken away several people from the Arawak tribe and Columbus went and got them and returned them back to their homes. I mean, it was amazing. That was amazing. It's in his writings. He went so, and got these people that had been taken away by these horrible other people and brought them back. So Tom Damigella writes, are you familiar with Howard Zinn and his book that was responsible <laughs> for Columbus's reputation? Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about Zinn's book and what you think about those writings in that book? Zinn knows absolutely nothing about Columbus is my feeling. Right. I've seen it. It's a horrible book. I don't know about the rest of it. I only read the part about Columbus and he's totally wrong. He knows nothing, absolutely nothing about Columbus. It's clear he has read none of Columbus's writings. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know. And people should not be having that book in, what is it, secondary schools now. I think it's a horrible look. Mm. They should have my book instead. <laughs> yes. But, yeah. you know, a free, a free ad. Yeah. Terrible, just terrible. Got it. I haven't read the rest of it, but about Columbus, it is absolutely, absolutely wrong. Mm. So and I can't say that strongly enough. It is just horrendous. So um, an anonymous attendee writes, many still blame Columbus for the raping of the indigenous people because of the actions of his crew. Is it fair to do that? I mean, at some point, Carol, I think you can say his crew did many of these things. He was in charge. The leader. Responsible right. and the leader. Shouldn't he yeah. have, um, take some accountability for that? It is true again and again. He kept saying, do not do this, do not do that. It's in all of his writings. It's in his um, letters to them. Do not go there. You know, while he's off sailing, still trying to find the Grand Clan, he leaves people in charge. Do not go raping, do not go marauding, do not do these other horrible things. And of course, that's just exactly what they did. And he is being blamed for it, but he was not usually there. He was not even there. I mean, I guess he could be blamed for not being there, but that was not his mission. He was supposed to be finding the Grand Con mm -hmm. to set up the trading post. And um, horrible things were done. There's no question about it, but it, it was not by any means by Columbus's desire or orders. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Several people asked, uh, Professor, about where you can find the letters of Columbus. Are these easily, uh, you know, are there, oh, yeah. so you go to the library, but are yeah. easily fine? Oh yeah, you can find them. I mean, I would start off with his diary. It's called, do you want me to show a picture of it? Yes. Absolutely, yeah. great. <laughs> It's in English. The diary is the first place to start. The diary of Christopher Columbus, first voyage, and it's. Uh huh. We're gonna put that out on our website. Okay, uh, and then there's the the um, biography by his son Ferdinand. Mm. And his son Ferdinand, he, on the third voyage. His son Ferdinand came with him and they were marooned on one of the islands for more than a year. And nothing bad happened. Columbus, you know, already he knew the language a little bit because he'd learned it along the way. And um, they made some trades so that the natives would help feed them and Columbus gave them things. And it was totally benign. Nobody was killed. Mm -hmm. This was when they were marooned for about a year. 
he and his son, Ferdinand. Could. So that's in, that's in Ferdinand's uh, diary of his, of his father. So those would be two. If you, if you were, obviously, you start your knowledge um, reading Columbus and the Quest for Jerusalem. That would be the, that's the holy grail. That's the start, yeah. <laughs> those two other books would be others. Are there other books that you would recommend that? No, no, I think those are the main ones. Should I show a copy of my book? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, where, where I, I thought I had it here. Yeah. Columbus and the Quest for Jerusalem. Nobody knows that that was the whole goal. Yeah. Carol, I have a question about that. How are your peers in higher education, other anthropologists, other professors, what was their response to your sort of positive interpretation of Columbus? Because that's really not the conventional wisdom amongst many, no, certainly. I have not heard no. from any of my colleagues about yeah. this. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm trying to think the book came out, maybe I had retired by that time mm -hmm. to, to do the research and to, to write it. I'm, I started it when I was still at Stanford, but I think I had already retired. So I probably wasn't there. Mm -hmm. to hear any responses. I have no idea what they think about it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they have read it. I hope mm -hmm. my colleagues at Stanford have read it, the ones who are teaching about Hispanic studies or, you know, mm -hmm. that period of time. I don't know. Can um, Maybe I have to try and find out. <laughs> so, Carol, if you could a little bit, one of the, one of the people that wrote um, was a contemporary of, uh, of Columbus was Las Casas. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, He's an interesting, there's an interesting history there in terms of what he wrote and how he's now being used, his writings are being used against Columbus. So could you give a little bit of a of background on that and who Las Casas was and what he wrote and um, what some of those criticisms are? That's very strange because he went over, he was very young, he was a lot younger than Columbus. And he went over with him, I think it might have been the fourth voyage, I'm, I really can't remember at this point. And um, he stayed there for a while in, and I think he stayed in the north coast of South America for a while, which is not where Columbus really was. Um, and I really have not read a lot of his writings. Mm -hmm. I would be very surprised to th think that he was, mm -hmm. you know, against Columbus. Yeah. But so, I, yeah. I have not read those writings at all. So I, can, um, I can't really say. Got it. No, I appreciate that. Uh, Roger Cochetti, uh, did he have any children? And are there any descendants alive today of Columbus? Well, I, son Ferdinand, who wrote yes. the, the biography, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he so also had a son, Diego. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So and he they did. Him on the yeah. voyages, if I'm not mistaken, right? What? And he, they joined him on the voyages, if I'm not mistaken, right? Well, Robert? Ferdinand did. I don't, I don't know if De, Diego did. Mm -hmm. Ferdinand did, yeah. Um, okay, um, we have a lot of questions here that have been coming oh, up good. to try to, yeah, no, uh, there's, uh, we're at 80, 67 questions. Oh my God, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to answer all of them, but I'll try. I, I know. Um, I'll try, it's been, you know, it's been almost 20 years since I did all this research, so it's, it's yeah. becoming a little bit difficult. Uh, I'm just kind of kind of scrolling through um, you know, do you have any sense of why, uh, Phil Fazio asks, why did Columbus leave Italy for Spain? Um, you know, and then another question was, was he a hundred percent Genovese from, from Genova? <laughs> that was a, yes. obviously somebody from Genova asking that question. Uh, he was definitely from Genoa. His father was the keeper of the lighthouse, which, you know, if you know Genoa, it's one of the main, uh, entrance and it would only have been given to a legitimate resident. Yes, Columbus was definitely Genoese. Got it. Yeah. Um, Max Scully asks the question, could you comment on the role that Francisco Roldan played in the story of Columbus? Roldan, I think he was a horrible guy, but I can't remember <laughs> quite why. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I would have to read my book again. Roldan was horrible. It's, uh, I think he came over at, um, one of the voyages. Yeah. And um, he started doing horrible things. That's mm -hmm. my memory. I would yeah. have to look up in my book about him, but I can't One do more that reason right. to read the book. 
<laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't really take a look right now, but Roldan, as my, my, my feeling is Roldan was one of the people sent over by Isabella and the other one was Bobadilla. And both of those two guys were so horrible about enslaving people and doing bad things against them. Mm. Against so, Columbus's, you know, orders. Well, we've, we've now gone, you know, we had said we, we're beyond where we wanted to be. I, I, there's so many other questions that come up. We're going to, well, we have them all saved and we'll see how many we can, have been already answered. But I, from your perspective as an Italian American community and as, as Catholics, uh, many of us being Catholic, um, you know, we look at Columbus as one of these symbols of our community. And um, trying to understand now, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to have this session was to talk a little bit about these, these myths that have come out against Columbus. You know, should he still be celebrated? You know, yes. some we're, as a, we're less objective because we're too close to it. So having someone like you on, you know, on this program chatting with us, do you think he still is someone that the United States should recognize with a day? And, and you know, if so, Absolutely. Why? I'm not Italian American. I'm Irish, well, English Irish, my name, Delaney. I mean, what can you expect? Yeah. No, <laughs> I, you know, I never knew very much about him. I told you until I, you know, started looking into the, after my class about millennial fever. And I came to really like him. I read everything he wrote. I've seen his letters, I've read his diary. Um, and read Ferdinand's diary uh, about his father. I came to like him. And I think he had, he did not have bad motives or anything like that. Mm -hmm. He was always hoping to meet the Grand Khan and set up a trading post. It was not to get slaves. That was done by the horrible people that Isabella sent over. And he had a hard time um, controlling them. He was one man. Mm -hmm. And there were hundreds. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So um, with that, I, you know, I want to just uh, give you an opportunity again to show your book, um, Columbus and the Quest. Happy <laughs> to do that. Happily, happily so, which, by the way, uh, uh, won several awards and was uh, the New York Times bestseller list, if I'm not mistaken. Lon I London Times. London mm -hmm. Times, excuse London me. London Times, um, the best book of the year. Yeah. Yeah. And book of the year. So I think yeah. on many levels, it's a, it's a great read. And uh, the Thank reason you. I got to know... Uh, got to know you before I got to know you and I had a chance to read. Um, you mentioned some of the diaries of Christopher Columbus as other information that people should look at. Uh, people have been asking that question as well. I would suggest people to go to niaf.org um, and there is a, um, a new group that has been created called nocolumbus.org. Oh, good. Together information so that you can also kind of deepen and uh, enrich your knowledge of Christopher Columbus. So with that, I just wanted to thank my colleague Anita for stepping in because of bad internet, but more importantly, <laughs> to thank you, Professor Delaney, for your time, your wisdom, you. oh. and the incredible work that you've done to put... Uh, well, I'm so happy, and I'm just so totally distressed about the destruction of all these statues that is going on. Mm -hmm. well, we are. It's got to stop. It's just got to stop. They know nothing about the guy. Thank you. Well, hopefully programs like this and the continuation of your good work uh, will help educate people and make them realize why they should care about Columbus. So with that, on behalf of the National Italian American Foundation, my colleague Anita, thank you so much for being with us today. And ci vediamo presto. Thank you. Well, delightful to be here. Thank you so much.